Hello, hello. Good afternoon, everybody. And welcome to Thursdays with Friends. This is an online conversation on current issues. The topic this week is um, advocating while social distancing. And this program is brought to you by FCNL, the Friends Committee on National Legislation. This is a national nonpartisan Quaker organization that lobbies Congress for peace, justice, and environmental stewardship. I'm the show's producer, Leslie Wolfbear Pinkham, and here's our chat host for Thursdays with Friends, FCNL General Secretary Diane Randall, and her guest, Shoshana Abrams, FCNL's Advocacy Teams Manager. Thank you, Leslie, and welcome, everyone. It is always a delight to see um, familiar names. I um, appreciate those of you who are putting in the chat where you're from, Margaret from Wisconsin and Carol from Tennessee. I see um, Joe Volk from Pennsylvania. So we're really happy to have all of you on with us um, and thrilled that uh, Shoshana is joining us. Um, I really am looking forward to having you hear directly from Shoshana about the work of advocating while social distancing. And she'll provide, be providing insight and some resources about how we can continue lobbying virtually and, and also how your advocacy is making a difference. I want to thank all of you who have taken action over the last couple of weeks uh, to push for the Justice in Policing Act. Um, if you joined us two weeks ago, you know that Jose Was was our guest and talking about actions that Congress can take to address policing reform that we believe will have an impact on racial, racial justice. So I urge you to take a look at that on our website and thank you. I think we, this morning when I looked at it, we were up to about 10,000 actions and we encourage you to share that with friends too. I know that many of you are also acting locally uh, to address end, to end, end police brutality and to address racism in your local communities. We know what many call America's original sin of enslavement and its legacy of white supremacy continues to pervade and to poison our society. And that is work that all of us must do individually for the organizations we care about, such as FCNL and for institutions that are important to us. I wanna talk now about how our lobbying by people all across the country, including I think probably almost every person on this call is making a difference. Uh, my guest today is Shoshana Abrams. Shoshana is FCNL's Advocacy Teams Manager, and many of you know her in that capacity. Before she joined FCNL, Shoshana uh, was doing peace building work uh, on the Middle East. This included three years working for Kids for Peace International, which is a nonpartisan interfaith organization that brings American, Palestinian, and Israeli teenagers together for long-term interpersonal engagement. So welcome, Shoshana. Thanks for having me, Diane. I'm really excited to be on this call. I, I was saying to Diane in preparation for this call that I don't often get to be the one who's interviewed. So uh, I'm happy to get a chance to, to speak to all of you um, about advocating for the world we seek. And um, I know many of you are on advocacy teams, so I wanna thank you all for joining. And I also wanna give a special thanks to all the donors that make this work possible. Um, so, so thank you. Thank you for taking the time to be on this call and being close, good friends with FCNL. Um, should I make some opening remarks? Yes, please. All right, great. Um, so right now I really want to talk about why it's important to continue to advocate, even given the situation of social distancing and kind of especially given where we are with COVID. Um, Congress is still working. They are still, uh, debating, voting, coming out with amendments to really big pieces of legislation. And we don't want them to be doing that without hearing from their constituents. So this is a great opportunity to continue to do that when a lot of people might not be uh, taking that extra step. Um, one of the things that we've found, especially on advocacy teams, but even more broadly in the organization, is that lobbying during this time is actually meaning that constituents are being able to lobby with the DC policy staffers that actually know the issue that you're lobbying on. So for instance, some of our teams uh, who are working on foreign policy issues might regularly meet with a field representative in a district office, but they're actually now being able to talk to the foreign policy staffer in the DC office who knows the ins and outs of the issue 
and who can provide some of that background information to, uh, back to the constituents that gets relayed to us in their lobby reports. So that's a huge benefit of this current situation. Um, as I mentioned, those big pieces are still moving. So right now the National Defense Authorization Act is still moving in Congress and those amendments are really important. That's often a way that Congress moves anything, uh, gets through on a big piece of legislation. So those things are still happening. And then lastly, it's important to point out that this is going to last a long time. Um, FCNL's uh, legislative director for foreign policy, Diana Olbaum, sent around an article um, that was in the Hill that maybe someone has that can put in the chat um, that said that we're going to be in this situation for a long time. The congressional offices on the Hill are not going to be seeing lobbyists and constituents coming to them for some time. And so we should settle in. We should get comfortable and we should uh, develop our skills for virtual lobbying because it's totally possible. Um, and it's really important that we continue to do so. Right. And most of us are calling in and Zooming our homes. Um, I'm in my kitchen today, which is a change of location for me, but um, I welcome you into my home and thank you for welcoming us into your homes. Um, but I do think this is a, uh, I, certainly when we onto a lockdown, I think many of us were anticipating a few weeks and now it's a few months and now it could be even longer. And so it is really important that we don't stop the advocacy work that we know makes a difference. Lobbying Congress is really the heart of what FCNL does. And as you know, we're staffed with uh, individual lobbyists who take on key issues and they work on the Hill day in, day out. That lobbying is continuing, even though they're doing it from their homes. They're lobbying virtually as well. Um, and Shoshana's gonna, and she's given some good feedback already, but walk us through some of the tools we have created in order for you to continue the virtual lobbying. But I want to tell you that um, we know we have direct experience, which is important to us about why uh, grassroots lobbying works. But we've also been looking at research that's come out from the Congressional Management Foundation, um, who regularly is interacting with congressional offices on the Hill and whose studies have consistently shown that the most effective way to advocate includes uh, constituent visits. 94% of offices say constituent visits make a difference. That's you, you're the constituents. Um, individualized emails make a difference, not the canned emails or the petitions, but the individual ones where you tell your story. Um, individualized postal letters, about 88% said that makes a difference, and local editorials. And these are all tools that we use throughout all of our programs. Certainly the advocacy teams use these, but others who individually may not be part of an advocacy team use them as well. So I'm gonna ask Shoshana to tell some stories about um, how lobbying works, how we've seen uh, the efficacy of constituents talking to uh, individual congressional offices and how those congressional offices have responded um, and how, uh, just kind of the story, because it's usually not a single action that is taken that makes a difference. It's often kind of continuous and sustained action that helps build relationships. Yeah, absolutely. So I have two stories that I'll share with you and hopefully I will be able to do this in quick order so that you get the, get the gist. But I have so many from our teams and I'm sure people on the call could ha also have stories of their own. Um, so our Milwaukee advocacy team, they were one of our first, actually I think the first advocacy team that was started in 2015. Um, and they've been building a relationship with a newer representative, Representative Moore. Um, and they have been building this relationship over time. And they just had a lobby visit, I believe two weeks ago or a week and a half ago um, with this office. And they were advocating for a easement of sanctions on Iran. And the ask was to get uh, Representative Moore to send a letter um, to the administration to call for a, a general license of humanitarian goods um, to ease sanctions on Iran. And uh, they had a great meeting. And then the follow up to that meeting, Representative Moore sent out that letter. Um, and the staff member uh, sent a quick follow up email just letting them know that this happened. So not only did the, did the member of Congress take the action that the team requested, um, but actually the staffer made sure that the team knew that, the, that they were responding to uh, the request. 
Um, so that shows a lot of different levels of uh, relationship building. And we don't always see that exact moment of, uh, of connection, but that was a really great story to see. I'll share a story from a little bit, um, from a little earlier this year. We have been working on preventing war with Iran on the advocacy teams. And we are working to support SJ Res 68, which was Senator Tim Kaine's Iran War Powers uh, Bill. Um, and uh, we weren't sure if we had the votes in the Senate to get it passed. Um, we thought we had most of the Democrats who are uh, going to support this, but we didn't know exactly where the Republicans stood on this and how many of the Republicans were going to support it. Um, and so our team in Kansas actually met with Senator Moran's office and advocated for this. And Senator Moran's staff followed up with the team after the meeting and said, just wanted to let you know that Senator Moran is planning to support SJ Res 68. That was amazing because we knew early on before the vote happened that Senator Moran was going to uh, vote this way. But not only that, we found out and we were able to pass that information along to our lobbyist, Hassan, who's working on the Hill. And Hassan was able to be in touch with Senator Collins' office and influence her to talk to Senator Murkowski's office. Um, and then we ended up seeing 55 senators vote uh, for SJ Res 68, which is just an incredible uh, bipartisan measure in today's Senate. So that work in combination with our, lo our lobbyists on the Hill and our constituents across the country just makes a huge effort. Um, and that combination of the policy wonk of the Hill and the constituent heart just makes all the difference. Thanks for sharing those stories specifically about Representative Moore and Senator Moran. Those are great stories. And um, I do wanna note that we're seeing people uh, share information in the chat. Looks like friends in Ohio, uh, 12th district have a meeting with their member tomorrow, which is great to see. Friends are also sharing some uh, Zoom etiquette and protocol so that if you're, and we ask you to mute yourselves uh, in listening mode for now. Um, also, um, people are uh, sharing information if you're having bandwidth problems that if you close the video portion, it might be easier to hear. So just wanna make sure that you can hear everything. Um, this is a 30 minute call and I want to just note about uh, a third of the way in that um, we are going to take questions and the easiest way for us to do that is to have them in the chat. And so if you have questions or uh, something you'd like to share, if you could put that in the chat for us, that would be great. Um, most people are joining us on Zoom, although this is also on YouTube and Facebook Live and um, our staff who are participating communicate the questions or comments to us if there are some to include. Uh, Shoshana, let's turn and talk about the area that you directly in um, helping build and nurture and communicate um, the advocacy teams, which are a really impressive group of people all across the country. Um, tell us about the program that's been in existence for about five years, you know, how it's growing and changing and, and maybe challenges that you're addressing now during this time. Great, thank you. Yeah, so we are in year five of the advocacy teams program. Um, we started with seven teams and now have 120 in 42 states, uh, which is really amazing to see. Um, we've come a long way. So we've lobbied on different issues each year. Um, and I think it's worth pointing out some of the progress that we've made on some of the issues that we've been working on. And so over the past three years, since 2018, we've been working on um, congressional war authority. Um, and as you know, as a Quaker organization, we are against war as a full stop. But we know that a way to, and we know that a way to uh, decrease the chances of war is to get Congress to reassert its authority over this issue and to not have this issue solely last uh, land on the hands of the president. Um, and that's a problem no matter who the president is. Um, and so we've been really working with Congress to change that conversation um, and get them to reassert its authority. And so we started doing this um, in 2018. Um, really, we did it a little bit before with trying to repeal the authorizations for use of military force. Um, but really in 2018, we started this concerted effort. And what we've seen is in that time is the House vote multiple times to repeal the 2001 and 2002 authorizations for use of military force and for to see two uh, war powers resolutions being passed on Yemen and Iran. And it's just becoming this uh, 
um, this, this real momentum and movement behind Congress reasserting its authority in a bipartisan way. And that's largely due to the advocacy team's support of this issue. They are bringing it up in all 42 states. That's 80, uh, 86 senators that are, being, that are hearing this message. Um, and that consistent messaging is making a difference. Um, one of the things that we're working on now as we have 120 teams is on state networks, on state collaboration. Um, we started this in Pennsylvania with where we have, I think, nine teams. And so what does it mean for all these nine teams to work together and how can they work to influence their members of Congress um, as, a, as a unit um, and in collaboration? How can we waterfall a message between the different teams that exist so that the senator is continually hearing a progressive argument across the state? So um, those are some of the things that we're working on. And I'll just say that, you know, all of this is a long term process, right? We're not going to change Congress overnight. We're not going to see a world, see a world free of war and the threat of war overnight. And so what we've been trying to work on with the advocacy teams is how do we ride the ebb and flow? Last year, it looked, we looked, it looked really close on repealing the 2002 authorization for use of military force. We thought we had it in the NDAA, uh, in the negotiations for the National Defense Authorization Act, and we lost last minute. But one of the first things that Congress did in January of this year after the attack on um, Iranian General Qasem Soleimani is repeal, is the House voted to repeal the 2002 AUMF. If we had not been doing all of that advocacy all year, the year before, I don't believe that they would have made that step. And so a lot of what we're doing is educating Congress until the situation is ripe, until we have enough support to, uh, to repeal these authorizations. Thanks. That's a, a kind of a long term story, really, about this work. And I think that's one of the aspects of the advocacy that's so impressive is that people make this commitment to uh, do this work uh, month in and month out. And um, I'm wondering if you could just say a little bit more about what um, FCNL does to support the teams because the teams are really acting on their own, but we are trying to provide the kind of support that gives them information um, and uh, equips them to build relationships with their local offices. Could you say a little bit more about that? And then I'll just say a second question that you can go into is, um, I have heard remarkable stories about what it means to individuals to participate in this. We've talked a little bit about what it means to congressional offices, but what might it mean for an individual to be part of a team and to build this kind of relationship? Yeah, I can speak to that for sure. So um, the, the first thing, advocacy team staff provide a lot of support for people who are really interested in uh, in doing this long-term work month in and month out. I think, so one of the things that we do is we provide a national call um, every month. Um, and that call features an exciting guest speaker. Um, so on the last call, we had a, a Iranian American journalist who spoke to our network uh, about the real uh, implications of sanctions during COVID. Um, the, the month before we had a, a representative Jim McGovern on the call who, uh, actually said the quote that was on the scroll screen before we started, um, who spoke to how important it is that we're doing the lobbying that we're doing. And one of the things that you get with the advocacy teams program is a chance to uh, ask questions with these experts and uh, really be in conversation with them. The other thing you get is a briefing from our lobbyist on the Hill. Um, so Hassan El Teb, our lobbyist on Middle East policy, um, is on every call to give a briefing on the latest on what's happening. Uh, on our policy, but also to answer questions for teams across the country. Um, so that's one piece, the national call. And then the other couple pieces are you get to talk to, to me if you have a question, um, and as well as our staff, Sarah Freeman Wolbert and Theo Sither and uh, Jim Kaysen, if you're lucky as well. Um, and uh, you, uh, we also provide a action sheet each month. So a suggested action that will help guide you during the month. Um, so we know that every team is in a different place with who they should be meeting with, but we try and uh, give an action that will move our general ask along. So sometimes it will be getting a co-sponsor or sometimes it will be advocating for, um, for an amendment to be added to the NDAA. Or sometimes it will be, we really need a media piece published, a letter to the editor published that would amplify our message. 
Um, and so we give guidance on those things in an action sheet each month. And there are some additional things as well, um, additional communicator calls um, and things like that. But um, we really do work to support teams and help them as they develop their relationships with their members of Congress. To your next question about what it means to participate in this. So I think for different people, it means different things. So the advocacy teams program is not just a program for Quakers, although many of our constituents are Quakers. Um, but so for many people, this is a faith practice. Um, being able to love thy neighbor, looking for that of God in the other person, when you're talking about your member of Congress can be quite difficult. Um, even our best members of Congress, we often find really good reasons to disagree with them. And so we hear many constituents talking about the practice of going into an office and really looking for connection as a faithful spiritual practice um, that helps them develop that, that, that piece. And then I'll share one other story if I have time. Um, so uh, our, our team, one of our teams in West Virginia spoke about uh, really struggling to build a relationship with their representative. Um, they had an unsuccessful meeting when they were asking for um, them to, to co-sponsor a repeal of the 2001 authorization uh, of use of, for use of military force. Um, and uh, they didn't think it was going to work. And um, this advocacy team member speaks about a moment where she said, you know, I just have to look for that of God in, the, in my member of Congress. I have to keep going. And from that point, they decided to do this huge letter to the editor campaign to get more things published in the, in the newspapers about this. And then lo and behold, three months later, the uh, member of Congress decided to sign on as a co-sponsor for that piece of legislation. Now, we never say that our lobbying was the one thing that convinced that member of Congress to do that action, because that would be really difficult. But what we can say is that our commitment, our uh, desire to keep coming back and building that relationship and not giving up and looking for that of God in our members of Congress really does have an impact long term. Thank you for that story, because I do think it's important to, to recognize that um, our work, uh, it does engage us as people who have that opportunity to be engaged with Congress, and we ought to exercise it. And so the people who are active with FCNL are doing that. Um, I want to give a, a big thank you to those of you who are on advocacy teams. If you're not on an advocacy team and you'd like to be on one and you'd like to try to start one, Shoshana or Sarah Freeman Wolpert, who works with her in this program, would love to talk to you. And um, I would love to see us have advocacy teams in all 50 states. It's been um, challenging to get into the Dakotas, I'll say, and uh, a couple of other Midwestern states, but we are still trying. And so if you live there or you know someone who lives there and might be interested, please put them in touch with us and we'll We'll work with you from sort of the get go about and and provide training that is uh, extensive. But not everyone can give that commitment to being on an advocacy team. And so I want to turn now and talk about the resources that FCNL has set up to do virtual lobbying, um, including what I would call a little mini training of 30 minutes um, where someone can learn how to lobby. And I think Wesley or Susan, I guess Susan Navi is putting these resources up and Jim put some resources up in the website. Um, I do just commend our communications team for the robust web, website that uh, continues to change and evolve constantly to meet the needs of constituents, um, but also it continues to try to share what's going on in Washington, D.C. on these issues, these legislative priorities that FCNL works on. I do encourage you to visit our website probably a couple times a week if you can. I know you, if you're on our email list, you get a lot of email from us as well, but uh, we really are producing a fair amount of uh, material, and so do, do take a look at it. Shoshana, tell us a little bit about this learn to lobby in 30 minutes and, and where people should go to do that and um, what can you what can you tell us? Yeah, absolutely. So I believe Susan put the link in the chat, but it's fcnl.org slash virtual lobby training. Um, and the link is uh, also the, the content is on the screen in front of you. Um, so uh, on this, uh, for this call, we really get um, in depth with what are the ins and outs of virtual lobbying? What does it look like? How is that different from the regular lobbying? Maybe you come to annual, uh, FCNL's annual meeting and you're used to that kind of lobbying. 
it's not all that different, but this uh, 30 minute training will walk you through what's different about it. Um, and you'll be able to ask questions. And that training is with uh, advocacy teams trainer, Sarah Freeman Wolpert. You're not signing up for an advocacy team. You're just learning how to do that virtual lobbying. And I'll just flag that FCNL advocacy teams had a big hand in getting us ready to virtually lobby. A lot of them were doing some of this work um, already uh, connecting with DC offices from afar. And so um, we really are grateful for them for, for giving us uh, some of the, the background and the knowledge for how to do this virtual lobbying. Um, and furthermore, besides just the call that I would love for you to sign up for, the fcnl.org slash virtual lobbying has a lot of resources on just how to do it. So if you don't have time for the call, but you wanna be walked through it, um, that's on the website as well. And you can even click a link, I think, to be connected to an organizer to help you. Uh, well, we're closing in in the last few minutes here, and I'd like you to think about closing remarks you want to make, Shoshana. I will say that, um, as you know, we never leave the opportunity to ask you to take action. And so um, there is an action request, and, and I want to just say there is really an action request for almost every issue that FCNL works on. So, um, you know, you may feel like your member of Congress is tired of hearing from you, but a lot to ask of them. There, this is a this is a moment in time where we need our members of Congress to step up, and you are the best people to ask that. You and if you belong to a Quaker meeting or another faith community, if you have family and friends who are willing to act, feel free to share our resources. Um, we are doing everything we can to to use these resources and even to reach out to other faith based communities who may have networks. And so. Uh, Jim's just put up the FCNL No War with Iran action alert. We urge you to take a look at that and, and act today. Um, so uh, we don't have a lot of questions here other than please continue to send out this information, this updated information um, within our uh, this week, which is our weekly email. We will do so. Um, I want to ask Shoshana if she has some closing remarks and then um, I just want to note before we close off that we have other events uh, happening by Zoom that we want to make sure you know about and invite you to. So Shoshana, make your pitch for everyone on here to go do virtual lobbying. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me and thanks thanks for all of you who decided to, to join this call and who will take action after this. Um, your voice is incredibly important, and you might think that you don't know the issue well enough to be able to speak to your members of Congress, but that's just not the case. Members of Congress, to act, need to know that their constituents are behind them. So what you're doing by talking to your members of Congress is helping them be brave and helping them act. And if you can bring people from different areas together, uh, technology is allowing us to do that in this moment. So if you can bring together people from different areas, it helps your member of Congress know that there's wide, broad range support for this issue. So no matter what the issue that you're lobbying on, you don't need to know the ins and outs of the policy. We have leave behind really important documents that you can hand off. Um, you can go and tell your story, tell them why you care about this, and it will make an impact and just report it back to us so that our lobbyists can follow up with those important details. So tell your story, speak from the heart and report back to us on what happens. That's terrific. Thank you, Shoshana. And thank you so much for joining me on this Thursdays with Friends. And um, again, I just saw someone do a sign off to say, see you on our monthly call. I know you'll be seeing many of these people. Um, I do want to note that um, we are having a special event tomorrow on Juneteenth. Um, and that event is a viewing of a documentary, a brief document, brief less than an hour documentary called Suppressed about um, the, the challenges of uh, access to the ballot. And uh, Jose Wass is our host for that event and has secured a couple of uh, people to be speakers in response to the film. We have had a huge response of people who are interested in participating in that event. And if you choose to be involved, you can, um, I think Wesley will put up a link, but you can find that on the homepage of our website. Another event that is taking place next week um, uh, on our Quaker Changemaker series is a conversation with two elected officials, uh, Jasmine Krotkoff, who is a state legislator in Montana, and Michael Snar, who is a city council member in Wilmington, Ohio, will be speaking uh, with Alicia McBride, who is the director of Quaker leadership at FCNL. 
And um, we urge you to join us and find out about uh, how people are led to be elected officials because of their faith. Um, it is something that we think is a real opportunity. It's certainly something that we promote with young adults to be involved in elections and to think about running themselves. Um, and in the future of Thursdays with Friends, we'll be talking a little bit more about upcoming in elections and questions for candidates. Uh, we have those available and we'll be sending more information out about those. In two weeks, my guest will be Alicia Cannon. And Alicia is the young fellow who has been working in our environment and energy, sustainable energy program. Um, I'm really excited to have her on with me and she'll be talking a little bit about climate change and COVID and I don't think you'll wanna miss it. So please join me two weeks from today and, and take a look at the homepage of the website and those pages that talk about virtual lobbying. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you all for supporting us financially at FCNL that allows us to continue to do this work. We hope that you have a good um, midsummer uh, as, as we approach that and uh, are celebrating the Supreme Court decision about DACA today with us, which we are thrilled about. So stay well. Thank you, friends.